Welcome to the Safe Business Agility Podcast. This is the place to get advice, stories, perspectives, and updates about safe and related topics to help you work differently and build the future. This week's episode is brought to you by Rally, the only purpose-built solution designed to scale agile and unite the enterprise to empower value stream management and digital transformation. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. All right, today is an awkward and exciting podcast. Why is that? Because we're sitting here talking to Joe, who I spend every waking minute of every day working with in great pleasure. But now Joe's on the other side of the mic, and he's going to tell us about the things that get him really excited. So Joe, first off, tell us about you and who you are. Well... Uh, thanks, Adam. You don't know who I am by now? Um, I, I right. don't. I, You know, I actually had to watch our first podcast we recorded together in 2017 when we talked about innovation accounting to figure out just exactly who this guest was. Oh, so this is just an extension on this six years later, so I get it. So I'm Joe Valone. I'm an SPCT and SAFE fellow. I've been with Scaled Agile about eight years now. Um, I was employee number 25 and SPCT number 20. So um, been working in and alongside uh, Agile implementations probably since the 2002 timeframe. Um, back then I was working with Borland. And if anybody uh, out there in Radio Land is familiar with Borland, or have heard of Borland, then uh, congratulate yourself. You are officially old. Joe, now that you've classified me as old, I, I got to ask, did you um, did you ever work on Star Team? I did not. Um, I did not work on Star Team. It was a CM tool. I remember that. That was one of my first gigs out of the Army was I, uh, I took a, an STLC integration gig where I had to seamlessly trans- transfer statuses between Rational Rec Pro... Star Team Quality Center and Oracle Core, yeah, with ETLs no. and staging tables. It was fun. That was that was not my my gig. We were working more in rapid application development, um, and the uh, the Borland Studio series. And so we um, that's where we kind of cut our teeth on Agile. We were uh, working with rapid application development deployment. We were trying to um, build the tools that people could use to develop things faster. And what was introduced to me at that point was extreme programming, which um, I thought was pretty cool and found out it was uh, an agile later on found out it was an agile methodology. So um, started with XP. When I got to Nokia some years later, um, we switched to Scrum from our, our waterfall methodology. That's where I got to meet a lot of, um, who's who sort of of the actual community, um, in, in Nokia, Dallas, I met Dean Leffenwell and I've worked with, um, other folks in the actual community, such as Mike Cohn and Ken Schwaber and Kenny Rubin, who was in charge of the Scrum Alliance at the time. So a lot of, uh, folks that, that we ran into are kind of now a who's who of, of agile at this point. Um, and then after I left Nokia, um, I was a vice president of engineering for a, um, a, a big data startup and helped them move to Agile. And then, uh, and then I decided to do this on a more full-time basis. So uh, since that time, I got to work with a bunch of different companies helping with their Agile transformations. So those are companies like American Airlines, Microsoft. Uh, Apple, et cetera. Um, and a lot of those opportunities uh, became even more prominent after I joined Scale Agile. So how did that go, Joe? So you you first mentioned all of the people that you ran into, including Dean. So what was it about Dean besides his magnetic personality that brought you to Scaled Agile? What, what made you decide to hang your hat in, in the current season of your career? I won't call it the later season of your career because you have many more seasons. What made you decide to come here? Well, um, I did the standard interview at the time with Drew and flew out to Boulder and uh, Jennifer, and we all kind of knew each other. We had interacted, so it wasn't uh, any kind of an awkward meeting uh, associated with that. And then I had an interview with Dean, 
And um, the interview was was great. There were a couple of points, selling points that really drew me to the company. One, I, I like the size of the company. It's a nice small company. Uh, and I knew the people there, so I liked that. I liked just how it felt. But Dean, Dean brought up a couple of good points in the interview, and he said, we're not you know, you know, the people here, this is not some kind of Darth Vader type of, of implementation. So he had me hooked with the Star Wars reference automatically. Um, and he said, hey, what you see is what you get. These are the folks that we're working with. You know, these folks, it's not like you're going to come, come here and turn into something that it's not. You know who we are and what we do and what we stand for. So um, certainly the values and the principles. But then the real hook was um, when he was asking about my business and I said, you know, it, that, that's a really tough choice for me because I'm at this this tipping point of whether I'm going to start hiring a whole bunch of more people and kind of go in a certain direction with my business um, or come work for a company like yours. And he said, well, you know, I, I would be the last person to talk you out of running your own business. You know, I've, I've done eight of them myself. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Um, he said, but let me ask you a question. Are you weekends your own? And I said, well, what do you mean by that, Dean? He said, well, when I ran my own company, small kind of starting up, uh, on the weekends, I spent the time billing. I spent the time marketing, uh, invoicing customers, uh, trying to, uh, get more contacts. And the more I thought about it, I, I said, yeah, you're right. The weekends are not my own. I'm, working during the week, traveling, doing the things that I need to do for, for my boutique business. And then on the weekends, uh, I'm working even crazier stuff. And he said, well, come work for me. I'll give you your weekends back. That was it. Sold. It's a, it's a pretty easy value prop right there. Yeah, you got it. And I will say that's something that I feel like we've always done a pretty good job of is if we work weekends, it's because we've chosen to work weekends or we travel over the weekends because we're going international, but it's all self-induced and the company's always been good about balance, right? So if you work a weekend, take some extra time. Yeah. And that's, I think it's kind of a cool thing about where Dean was in life and where Dean is in life is that he values time above all else. And he wants to make sure that all of us are also valuing our time. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And um, learning you know, um, make, make sure that we are spending time, uh, learning new things, whether it's, it's AI or new things in, in finance and agility, spend some time, gather the information and, and learn what you can. So Joe, if you would just kind of walk us through, and then I do want to get into your MBA and some of those other things, but you know, your first roles at Skilled Agile. So you started here, you were employee 25 ish, um, what did you do then and how has that evolved to where we are at now? Well, what I did uh, early on was we didn't really have a consulting company. All of us did consulting because it was part of the Gemba, right? The, the Japanese word meaning where work is done. We were doing a lot of observations with customers, um, helping them out whenever they had issues with um, safe implementations or questions. And so I, I was um, primary point, kind of a, a globe hopper, helping to build safe implementations, helping to grow customers um, all around the world. So I wasn't just relegated to the U.S. because we were trying to grow in, in other areas like Germany and um, the, the greater European area, the U.K., uh, as well as uh, Asia. So all of those were, were open for us. So a large amount of time initially was spent with consulting, but we knew that wasn't, we knew that we were going to have partners to take care of that. And that wasn't our primary goal was not to create a consulting business and compete with our partners. So we knew that was a temporary thing until we, we got the growth. So from there, uh, I also started working with, with Drew, uh, because I had gone through the beginnings of the two certifications from the Scrum Alliance, the, the CEC, the Certified Enterprise Coach, uh, as well as the CST, the Certified Scrum Trainer. Um, and there were things that I liked about the process and things that I disliked about the process. And I brought those to Drew and, you know, he said, well, we've got this SPCT program. Why don't you, and I, you know, I was totally for it. He said, why don't, why don't you help me out with the SPCT program? I said, great. So we started working together on, on kind of evolving the program and, and building a better program. 
And that takes us to where we're at today because we're still doing those very things. We are still doing those things. It's evolved, um, but there's still, the more it's evolved and the larger it has scaled, uh, the more work there is to do. While I'm sitting in the studio today, I thought I'd take a minute to talk to you about Safe Studio, a game-changing platform for learning and practicing safe, no matter where you are in your safe journey. Picture this, your team streamlined like never before with common self-paced learning in the right assets at the right time, all at their fingertips. Safe Studio isn't just a tool, it's a breakthrough in aligning your team's effort with your big picture goals. And we've all been there. You go to a training class and you leave with all this energy and great ideas, but you get back to your desk on Monday and you're a little bit lost about how to apply all of that great content to your context. Well, Safe Studio helps you avoid that ambiguity by providing clarity, efficiency, and most importantly, resources to help you hit the ground running in your new way of working. But Safe Studio doesn't stop there. You'll also find tools to connect to the greater scaled Agile community, simplified course management in the virtual classroom, access to all of our platforms like piplanning.io, comparative agility, and others. You'll find templates to facilitate product development activities and safe events, along with toolkits, video tutorials, and good gracious, so much more. Check out Safe Studio today and see for yourself at safe.scaledagile.com. Now, back to the show. So let's talk about your educational experience, Joe, because I think, you know, knowing where you're at now, understanding your path and your passion in finances is an important backstory. Yeah. So um, I've always been, I probably spent the, with the exception of my stint at the big data company, um, the majority of my career is spent in deeply embedded cyber physical systems. Um, so early in my career, it was development of, uh, department of defense systems, specifically, uh, some of the systems in Cheyenne mountain. Um, so we worked with contractors and subcontractors there to, to deliver and build fault tolerant systems. After that, I went into the commercial sector, started working on embedded operating systems. Um, so those were things that ran in. Uh, well, a couple of things that I was uh, proud of in terms of the software. Um, our software is currently in the Tower of Terror ride in Walt Disney World and Walt Disney Land. So avoid that at all costs if you ride that, because that's my software. Um, GM's World of Motion, uh, at the time that was an Epcot ride that was there for, for years. Um, and then later on when I got to Nokia, uh, I started working on... Uh, well, Nokia and Apple, I started working on a lot of embedded um, implementations in mobile phones, primarily audio-based uh, things like codecs and DSPs and also the applications that, that plugged into there. Um, so um, I was doing that for a long time. And while I was at Nokia, I decided to go to the dark side and get an MBA. So my, my undergraduate degree was engineering. Uh, engineering technology, and that was from the University of South Florida's College of Engineering. And then I went back to school kind of late, um, had two young kids and decided that um, I was going to go and get an MBA, which uh, was a full-time program as well. So working full-time, going to school full-time, having full-time kids. Now the hours were adjusted, so I didn't have to worry about, um, it was mainly Fridays and Saturdays that I had to go to the class there, but it was two year program. Um, and while I was there, I got really, really intrigued with two, two subjects. One of those was, uh, economics, both the micro and the macro fascinated me for different reasons. Um, and then the micro economics really kind of, of, um, I, as I started studying that more, I got really into finance. Uh, and specifically around different measures that, that finance uses to figure out. I was obsessed really with, okay, so we're going to have this calculation and how do we know we actually got the value out of it? We said we were going to estimate this at some degree of profitability. And it never seemed like anybody went back to that and, and really tested, well, did we get that profitability? And if we did get, if we didn't get it, what did we get? And how could we have gotten this? A little bit better. But the more I looked at it, it just seemed people were kind of, you know, pulling numbers out of the air, for lack of a better, I mean, not too many 
companies that I was involved with when they were making these types of calculations for business initiatives that they wanted to invest in, not too many of them were, were uh, if any at all, were really kind of quantifying and saying, oh yeah, um, this is the number that, that, that we should use. This is the discounted cash flow hurdle rate that we should use. Um, and then when I'd ask, well, where did that rate come from? They'd be like, oh, you know, uh, well, this is what we have used. Well, is this project the same as what we've had? No, 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 completely different project. Okay, why are we using this? Then I got really turned on when SAFE was started using Weighted Shortest Job first. And I dug into that, reached out to Don Reinertz and said, this is really cool. I really like this. This is far superior to net present value and other things we use sort of the, as the gold standard. So um, I, I really became enthused and that was also a way to leverage my education to, to figure out sort of where I wanted to concentrate on. And that takes us to real options. So I, I know from firsthand experience how long you've been working on this, and it's been a lot of iterations. I think it's been a PI objective of ours since probably Q1. Can you kind of talk us through, for people that maybe don't understand what goes into having an advanced topic article published on the safe site, you know, before we get into the content, like what's that process like? What are those iterations like? Well, um, with this paper specifically, um, so I, I did the advanced guidance article on innovation accounting. As you know, we, we had a podcast about that subject a while ago. This article is actually a contribution article. Um, and so uh, as a contribution article, it did have to get vetted in, a, in, in some similar way. So the very first uh, experience was uh, a mob review. So they did a mob review with the framework team to go, okay, what's the subject matter? What are we talking about here? And so we had way, way, way too much. And when I say we, I'm talking about my co-author, Klaus um, Hertzman, who worked with me on this as well. We, we went through a mob review and we got a lot of great feedback in the mob review. And so we took that and said, okay, based on this feedback, feedback let's, let's adjust our outline. Let's adjust the draft in the following ways. And we had way too much content. The content will probably be used in, in future community contributions, but this one was just way too much, um, kind of read like, like a textbook. And so it was at the masterclass in January and I had a quick conversation with Dean and he said, yeah, you know, there is value in here. We just have to figure out how it works within the safe framework and, and see what makes sense. And so we had several meetings after that, some online, some in person, some face to face where um, we would iteratively go through the paper and go, okay, what do you think of this topic? And we'd have a couple of paragraphs written about that. It would get reviewed, it'd come back. We would answer the questions and it would kind of go through that until we got down to probably the, uh, the three or four or five pages that we have, we have now. So it was a lot of feedback, a lot of back and forth between us and, and the framework team, specifically Dean and Rebecca. I mean, I think it's not a surprise to anyone that we don't just write stuff and toss it up there, right? No. I think people don't really appreciate how much goes into every single topic and then how much thought goes into every single word. I mean, it's there, there's typically 2,500 words per article on the framework site. And when you go into those deep topics, that means every one of those words has to be meaningful and impactful and, and chosen carefully. And it is a lot. It is deep. But it's it's with intent, so I think that's a pretty cool like under the hood look. All right, so let's talk about real options, Joe. Let, let's get into it. I, we we've gone twenty minutes of talking about backstory. Let's talk about real options. So before we go into this, right? I mean, we can go on the safe blog, scaledagileframework dot com, and click on the blog, and you can find the intro and the link to Joe's article. But before we go into it, can you give us the Donkey Kong explanation? of your thesis. So real basic, real simple, what the heck are we talking about? First of all, real options is uh, is a concept that's taught by finance. Um, so it's not, it's not something exotic that hadn't appeared before or anything like that. Um, it, they were invented, real options was invented in the 80s and it was based off the concept of what people uh, do in commercial stock market trading. Um, they have these things called option contracts. And what an option contract is, is it gives you the right, but not the obligation 
to buy or sell shares at a certain price. So if I'm just Joe Schmo, or in my case, Joe Valone, and I want to go buy, um, let's say, 100 shares of Amazon, and let's say Amazon is pricing at, you know, $300 a share, then that's 3000 bucks, right? Well, I don't really have 3000 bucks that I can do that. Um, uh, sorry, that, but that was 10 shares. So I, I don't, I don't really have 3000 bucks that I can do that. Um, and so what am I, what am I going to do? Well, I could buy an option on 10 shares and I could say, Hey, um, if it, if it, Raises in price, you know, I'll execute that option. So I have the, the right, but not the obligation. Because if it, if it goes over its strike price, what I bought it at, then, you know, I'm in the money at that point in time. So I could instantly sell that option to somebody else, um, where they would make money. So I, I would, I would get that. And the same thing happens in reverse if I'm selling it. Um, so that's sort of the overall um, uh, idea of what an option is. Now, for real options, for companies. Well, hold on, Joe, because I think the way you explained it to me is even better because I'm not that smart, right? And you you spoke to me in terms of airplanes, which is my language. That's my nine-year-old love language is yeah. aircraft and tractors. But like, and so like the way that you explained it was, you know, if you're buying a jet from Boeing yes. and maybe – um, the jet today costs a hundred million dollars and you need two, but you might need three more in the next Correct. three years. You might say, Hey, I will give you $110 million today with the option to buy three more at $110 million over the next three years. So maybe you're offering a little more than the current strike price for the option to buy them at that same strike Correct. price. Um, if things inflate, and you're, just like the contracts you're placing a bet. Your bet is that the materials and everything else that it takes to create an airplane is going to go up. It's going to be more expensive. So you retain the option and you pay a premium for that um, to be able to buy them at that price. So you're rolling, you're rolling the dice a little bit because what happens if the opposite occurs? Let's say there's a depression in the materials and it's now cheaper to build those jets. Well, then you wouldn't execute that option. You would lose the premium, but you would still buy them at the the the, the lower price. Um, so it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hedge. You know, Southwest does it uh, all the time in a simplistic way, where they go, "Well, we bet the price of fuel is going to go up, or we bet the price of fuel is going to go down." So they place uh, these these option contracts on these things, fuel hedges, to decide whether they're going to execute that or not. Um, but yeah, real options, which is what you described, Adam, that's what that is. And that's how it differs from the commercial contract stuff. Um, those are real options. These are companies trying to make real decisions about their, their financial futures. I love it. So can you dive in a little bit then about how you see this fits into safe and kind of what, what the article talks about, how to use the concept of options trading in safe? Yeah, so... Um, the way this works is, think about it this way, it's probably easiest to articulate um, using the lean startup model that SAFE has. And um, one of the easiest cases to, to apply it to is the case when you have an MVP. So minimum viable product. We don't know whether we're going to go to market for this thing or not. There's a lot of risks. And you, in the beginning, you have that kind of cone of uncertainty, right? So we're talking about an approved EPIC that has gotten through the system. So it is now at the approved point. And we know that, well, if we're building a website, we don't want to spend $10 million and take a year on this website and not know whether we're going to get the value out of that or not. So we might say, you know what, let's put aside $2 million and let's build some minimum functionality in this website and see if it proves or disproves our hypothesis. Well, there's a valuation that occurs on that. So the fact that you are going to build an MVP, so you're going to do real work on something. And then at that point, you're going to look at the data and figure out, well, does this prove my hypothesis or not? Now, a lot of people look at that in very narrow terms and they look at it as, well, I have two options. I can either pivot or persevere and that's it. It's not really that simple. 
in a complex system, the things that we're building, the things that our customers are building, um, you know, whether that's a Boeing or FedEx or some other large customer, um, they're, they're building these very large solutions and they need to figure out what some of the options are. So what would be some of the options on that? Well, in our most optimistic case, the MVP is wildly successful and we productize it. And that gives us another set of options to say, well, the product was wildly successful, or maybe the product was only medium successful, or maybe the product was in a pessimistic case, what's, what's the worst case scenario? And so the real options helps us put probabilities on that. Now, previous to this, the way they got those, those probabilities and the payoff amounts was uh, in a lot of cases, they used um, discounted cash flows paired with what's known as a, a Black and Scholes model. They're guys who won Nobel Prize on their algorithm. And typically they use a Monte Carlo simulation. That's not really, really life. That's, that's, you know, that's again, hypotheticals and the Monte Carlo simulation doesn't work all that well in terms of large software and system projects. Um, so the guy that I, that I worked with Klaus kind of has his own IP. It's backwards compatible with Black Scholes algorithm, but it's a different algorithm. Um, and it's a different way that we use to calculate, or that he uses rather to calculate um, the cash flow and the returns associated with real options rather than kind of spinning the wheel for, for Monte Carlo. So from a from an investment point of view, it's not as simple as we're either gonna pivot or persevere. Maybe we're gonna refactor. Maybe we've gotten some data that tells us that, okay, we could continue to use it as is. We're just not going to make as much as we thought we were. Okay, well, how much? And what's the probability of success of, of that? So this gives us the option to, in the same words, have the right but not the obligation to continue by paying this, this premium. And the premium you're paying is the continued development effort. Sure, if you want to declare it a sunk cost at any point along this options tree, and this is actually shown in the white paper, at any point in this options tree, you can decide, yeah, we're not going to get the value out, I can exit, right? And then it becomes a sunk cost and you move on. But how do you make that decision? How do you make that sunk cost decision? How do you make that pivot or persevere decision if you don't see what options are available to you as well as the probabilities of getting a return on that investment or not. And so it's iterative. You can do that on an iterative basis. Think every PI, for instance, you might be making a decision around the features included in an epic of whether you're going to continue those or not based on probabilities, based on uh, returns. Um, doesn't really matter how you, how you calculate your free cash flows. Um, you know, anybody that knows me and knows my passion for finance and economics knows that I'm not a fan of net present value. If you want to use the discounted cash flow method, you certainly can. It's just not really recommended. Um, why? Because net present value was invented in 1908. And I think the economy has evolved a little bit since then. Um, don't know how many software projects were available in 1908, but it was designed for manufacturing because that's what was hot in 1908. So if you're, so the way I look at it is as follows. If you're building soft, uh, complex software projects, uh, software systems, cyber physical, um, those are things that, that are new, they're different, and the tools that we have today um, are not going to help you evaluate those. Real options were, will, but not the standard um, discounted cash flows that we use today. However, if you're in a manufacturing environment or you're doing linear development with not a whole lot of branching or the variability is easy to calculate, it's quantifiable and fairly stable, then like you get in manufacturing, then by all means use today's discounted cash flow. Um, I, I can, I can sum this up the way, uh, one of my mentors, Don Reinertsen summed it up. And he said, it used to be 
that we were incentivized on following a recipe. So if you're manufacturing, you are incentivized and rewarded on making sure that the widget that comes off the assembly line is exactly the same as the widget before it. Variability is a bad thing and we seek to minimize it. However, in a large complex software systems development effort, we are incentivized to not follow a recipe. We don't want to make it the same as the other guy. So we're incentivized for, uh, against uh, intellectual uh, or for intellectual property. We're incentivized to make this thing work and to be successful. And it might, in a lot of cases, be a one-off type of, of system. It may not be something like a manufacturing that we're going to just keep replicating over and over. Again. So, Joe, this is, I mean, obviously a very powerful tool. Where do you see it fitting best in, in what applications and do you see any instance where it might just be too heavy? Yeah. So um, we've been exploring a lot of different areas. Um, we think it is um, today it can be run at the portfolio level to do evaluation of epics. In fact, there's an example uh, from one of our customers in the paper. And it's, it's in an area that people struggle with all the time, which is in, in this case, the example that we used in the paper is a uh, platform. It's a software platform. So we are building a software platform. Most people struggle with that because it's not customer facing. It's internal customer facing. The customers for this are internal. Will the external customer get a benefit? Yeah, but not. it's not a monetary kind of benefit. They're not charging for that platform. So how do you make money? You make money by saving money. In this case, it's going to replace something and it's going to do a much, not much better job and you can evaluate those things. Um, and it's, it's excellent for that. It's excellent for giving you the options. How much are you going to invest in this platform before you say, now we've invested too much and we're just not going to do this anymore? You know, I could also see it being really powerful in a large solution context, right? So if you're building a cruise ship or, you know, some sort of a prototype that's cyber physical, um, you know, not even necessarily considering portfolio, but just when you start talking about the investment in capabilities yeah. and determining whether or not certain capabilities are things that we want to take to market or things that we don't. So there, there's a lot of applications, but I think the the takeaway is that it's good for the big stuff. But if you're talking about, you know, like in, in our context, which marketing initiative yeah. to undertake, Maybe not so valuable for that. So just like anything else in the framework, you know, we need to seek to understand intent and then apply with discretion. So really powerful tools. And I think it's a really great addition to the work that we do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what we don't want to see is every art in the country trying to figure out their real options for every feature. They prioritize every PI. Can you only imagine yeah. that? Like you go into PI one and we're going into backlog planning or arguing about Real options? Yeah, I don't. I don't think that would be conducive. And and so it, you're right. It's probably overkill at this point to do this at a feature by feature level. I think the combination of weighted shortest job first is is probably good enough. And you know the amount of economic damage that you can do in an R is limited. It's constrained. We have guardrails around that. When we start talking about portfolio, though, look out. I mean, if you've got initiatives that are that are taking a very long time and you need to evaluate that periodically to see if you're gonna continue or even an enabler, uh, as it was in this case, if you're gonna to continue to, to invest in that or not, you need to figure out what those options are for, for that investment. Um, I, I think it's also obviously overkill at the team level as well. We don't, we don't need to put anything uh, this stringent on there. I think product owners probably have enough knowledge at that level uh, to do it. So um, the two areas that I, that I think you could see that is if you're looking at the Kanban system, when you're in the analyzing review phase, and then later as you get into the, uh, the lean startup model, it's certainly appropriate for all that. And those numbers are adjusted in real time based on the information that you're finding out, figure out, okay, are, what are we more likely to do? Go, go, you know, the, the more optimistic route or, or something else. And so you, you have these, these different options available to you. The other area in the portfolio where we're experimenting with right now um, is participatory budgeting. I could see we're having option information 
at PB might help people better decide what things to fund. And by PB, you mean co-fund. Co-fund, yeah. That's the new rebranded yes. term. All the things change. Uh, which, I mean, that's a good place to plug the new CoFund app that's releasing. So we can check Absolutely. that out. And you know what? I wonder if when we're going through that exercise, if this couldn't end up being a component to it. So if you think about it, if we're if we're working with really big investments for a year or, or more, like our big bets, this could be a cool component. Maybe we'll have to go bug somebody about a possible integration. So you never know. It's definitely a possibility. And it's, it's stuff we've thought about. I don't think the market is there right now, but could definitely be there in the future. If you build it, they will come. Well, that's the theory. Well, Joe, can <laughs> you again remind people if they want to check out your white paper, where to find it? And also if they have specific questions, how to find you? So I'm available on LinkedIn pretty easily. And uh, so it's just Joe Valone, be like Victor, a L L O N E. Uh, LinkedIn there, Twitter is Joe J V. So I'm on there um, every once in a while tweeting about stuff. It's but it's business stuff unless unless I get upset at Delta or something like that, then then I might yell at someone. But that's that's how to find me. Um, and if not there, then check the FBI database. I'm sure they have a record of me. Uh, <laughs> Maybe the no fly yeah, list. Exactly. <laughs> and then also the paper, you can find the paper at skilledagileframework.com and click on blog. And it should be one of the top two or three posts at this point, And you can just search for real options. That's it. So Joe, is there anything you want to leave people with, with, you know, in terms of your words of wisdom before we sign off? Um, I guess uh, the, the main thing here is just to understand that um, when you're trying to engage in a conversation with finance and getting finance people on board, this is something they are familiar with. They may not be familiar with how to apply it within a safe context, um, but these are things they are familiar with. It's not foreign. It's not like uh, as much as I love WSJF, typically when you start talking to finance people about WSJF and Fibonacci numbers and proxy values and things like that, their eyes kind of glaze over. They want dollars and cents or euros. Uh, they, they want to understand these in financial terms. And that's what real options gives you. It gives them a way in their language in something they're familiar with how to properly evaluate funding options. I love it. Joe, thank you. Until next time. All right. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. The entire team at Scaled Agile is focused on helping you and your enterprise work differently and build the future. If you find this content valuable, please tell your colleagues and friends and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. To share your suggestions for the show, just drop us a line at podcast at scaledagile.com. I'm Adam Mattis. See you next time.